Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you today. It's a great honor. It's a pleasure to be here at the World Conference. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I'm Steve. And uh, the topic of my talk is going to be deliberately designing discomfort into people's interactions with computers. And that seems like a bit of a strange topic, doesn't it? I mean, if you've done a course on HCI, like myself, then I think you will have learned that the objective is to make people's interactions with computers as comfortable as possible. I thought that the idea was that computers should be predictable and that users should be in control and understand what is happening and that they shouldn't make mistakes and that their work with the computer should be efficient and above all, they should be satisfied. I thought that was the goals of HCI as I was taught them and even teach my students. So why then am I suggesting to you in my talk that we might like to break with that tradition and make people's interactions with computers uncomfortable? Well, the answer in part is because HCI has been turning in the last decade or so to the world of culture. And HCI has begin beginning to look at entertainment applications such as interactive games and artistic applications such as performances and installations. And those kind of applications have a different set of values and a different background. And in those sorts of experiences, discomfort of some kind is something that's routine. It's often designed into the content. And if it's in the content, then my position is that it should also be in our interactions with the content. So, I'd like to take you on a bit of a journey through discomfort, I hope you don't mind, and talk about four things. First of all, I'm going to try and convince you why this might be a good idea. What are some of the benefits to users of making them a bit uncomfortable? Secondly, we're going to learn from the masters. I'll present you some examples of interactive experiences that people have made that use discomfort in interesting ways. So we'll have some examples that we can look at to understand this thing. Then I'm going to do something a bit dangerous. I'm going to suggest to you four strategies that you might like to take out into the world and think about applying in your own experiences. Four ways to apply discomfort. And that's a bit dangerous because I'm not sure I want to send lots of people out of the room to make users feel bad. And I don't want to be the person who is responsible for saying that. So we'll have a bit of a discussion about ethics at the end as well. What is it appropriate to do? And how can we use discomfort in an appropriate way? So that's the roadmap. Let's make a start. <clears throat> so why design uncomfortable interactions? Well, I'm going to offer you three reasons. The first is because they can be entertaining. So there's an argument in some of the sociological literature that says, because for many of us, in our modern lives, we are far removed from violence and fear and physical confrontation, but that our bodies still have those systems, the adrenaline, the fight and flight response, that there is a gap. And that's why we turn to roller coasters and violent games and horror films to fill that gap. And if you're one of those people, like me, who does that kind of thing occasionally, then you'll recognise there are several important concepts in entertainment that rely on discomfort. One of them is thrill. It's a bit hard to define what thrill is, but on a roller coaster, the best attempt I can give you is it's an experience of fearful anticipation, followed by extreme physical sensation, followed by euphoria. That's thrill on a roller coaster. Another key emotion in entertainment is suspense. Suspense is not knowing what's going to happen. No, that's not true. Suspense is knowing what's going to happen when the protagonists don't know what's going to happen. And that's an uncomfortable feeling because you can't warn them or advise them. So discomfort is part of thrill and suspense and therefore part of entertainment. 
But I can get a bit more highbrow and lofty than that, a bit more worthy. This is HCI after all. You like to have a, a kind of more worthy perspective. Discomfort is also part and parcel of, and, uh, part of enlightenment. So one of the roles of artists in society is to confront us with difficult things and difficult materials and bring those into the, the public realm so we can experience them. And discomfort can be used to frame the interaction with difficult materials so that it's not trivial. <coughs> this picture here is of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, which is a museum that confronts some very difficult themes and material concerning the Jewish experience in the 20th century, including the Holocaust. And the architect designed the building, Daniel Liebskind, designed the building deliberately to be as uncomfortable as he could make it. It looks uncomfortable, it's full of irregular lines. The floors slope. When you stand in that building, you are never relaxed. You are never at your ease. Because that is how he wants you to feel when you're engaging with the material that's inside. So if we're going to use interactivity to engage people with challenging materials, then we have to think about how we frame those engagements so that they're appropriate and they're not trivial. On another note, there's a long tradition in spirituality of discomfort as being part of the path to enlightenment. People starve themselves, they go on fasts. People hurt their own bodies, all as part of a personal journey in various religions towards some kind of enlightenment. So discomfort is part, part of a, another kind of journey. And the third reason I'll offer you concerns sociality and the rite of passage. So again, you can read studies about teenagers watching horror films together, and those studies will say they are. Confronting that fear together is something of a rite of passage. Three or four years ago, I was studying families going to theme parks in the UK, and came across people who went back to a theme park every year, and each year as the children got a bit older, they would ride the next big ride in sequence, because that's what that family did. It was part of being in the family to go on the rides. It was their rite of passage. So, my motivating factors for making people feel sometimes a bit bad are ultimately you might entertain them, enlighten them, or bring them together. So let's take a look at some examples. For the past 20 years or so, uh, my lab's been collaborating with a series of artists to make interactive works. And in the next couple of minutes, I'll draw on just a couple of those to give you a sense of how they go about embedding discomfort into their experience designs. We'll start off with the world of performance and the use of technologies to make performance interactive and talk about the group of artists called Blast Theory. This is the group of people we've worked with for the most time worked with them since well, to exactly 20 years ago, 1996 was when we started. We've made 10 or 11 works with them that have toured. And I'll pick on one to show you uh, called Ulrika and Amen Compliant from 2009, so a little while ago. And uh, we'll just use this as an example to illustrate some of the ways in which the art artists make people uncomfortable. Well, Reader Name and Compliant deals with the subject of terrorism. It engages people who take part in the life stories of two terrorists, Aidan Collins, who was a member of the Irish Republican Army, and Ulrika Meinhof, who was a member of the infamous Bar Meinhof gang, both active in the 1970s. The work invites you to follow their story, one of them, and ultimately to confront it, and it takes the form of an interactive city walk. You're sent out into a city, the video we'll see in a moment is in Venice, where the work premiered. And as you walk around the city and explore it, you receive a series of automated phone calls. The phone calls begin to relate the story to you. They ask you to choose the character that you're following, Aimer or Ulrika. But as the, phone call, as the calls go on, they become more demanding. They begin to speak to you as if you were 
or legal or amen. And they ask you to become compliant with their instructions, sitting down on a bench, making a certain gesture, as if somebody was watching you. They also repeatedly ask you if you want to back out of the experience. And if you say you don't, then you're pushed to the next level. The experience ends with you being met and taken to an interview room where you're interviewed about your own attitudes towards violence. Um, and as you leave the interview room, you get a chance to look back at the next person who's coming along through a one-way mirror and to see how they respond to the same questions. So I don't know if that makes sense, but let's take a look at the artist's own documentation. So this is a short video clip from Last Theory that documents the work from when it was shown at the, at the Venice Biennale. Trained as an aeronautical engineer, 
He then went to the Royal College of Art, and these days he works as a television presenter in the UK, uh, an artist, and also a consultant to the theme park industry, which is a, sounds like an ideal job specification, really, doesn't it? What a fantastic job to have. And Brendan approached us because he wanted to look at how to use interactive technologies to extend the ride experience. This involved uh, quite a long journey through several different designs and prototypes that we made. His, his first idea, and the reason he first came to us, was because he wanted to build a personal telemetry system. You know the telemetry systems they have in Formula One cars that kind of send their data back to base so you can look at it on television? Well, he wanted the same kind of thing for the human body so that somebody would wear some equipment, undergo an extreme experience like a roller coaster ride, and that members of the audience, ideally their families and loved ones, could watch their response close up. So we designed this technology. It was a helmet with a camera looking at your face that you couldn't take off or look away from, a microphone to capture your screens and conversation, a heart rate monitor, galvanic skin response monitor to measure how much you're sweating, which may be a sign of anxiety or not, an accelerometer to measure the movements of your body, and finally, two small sensors to measure movements of key facial muscles associated with smiling and frowning. This data was streamed back to live audiences where it was displayed on a big screen so that whoever was watching would have a close-up view of somebody's ride. So the first time we tried this out was at the Science Museum in London, in the car park. We hired a ride and we got volunteers from the audience, we threw a party, they went on the ride, we showed their data and we had various people there to explain the data, psychologists, sensor designs and so on. And here's a, a very rough video clip of, uh, of how that first experience uh, sort of turned out, or how it looked. Watch out, this one's a bit loud. He experimented with various others as well during the event. And some of the videos we captured made for quite difficult watching. So I've got a video here um, uh, of a gentleman who described himself as a ride virgin. He said he'd never been on a, a large roller coaster at all. And for his first experience, he chose to ride, obli ride Oblivion, which is um, the world's first vertical drop roller coaster. So it's a bit of a biggie. Um, and I still find it a little bit difficult to watch this video. Uh, I'll share it with you anyway. I'm feeling really, really apprehensive. Like I wish I wasn't doing this. 
I really wish I wasn't doing this. <laughs> hey, nervous. Oh my god. I'm so scared. This doesn't feel real. I'm afraid to look at the camera. I don't want to look down. It's going to be alright. Don't look down. So the next stage was to think about, could we take this physiological material and make an interactive ride? We don't have the budget to make a, a roller coaster, so we made a bucking bronco ride. Anyone in the audience ever ridden a bucking bronco ride? Show me your hands if you have. Me, Patrick, and somebody else. Well, you've led far too sheltered lives. It's a fantastic, uh, fantastic experience. You can hire one, I'm sure, very cheaply. You can buy them. They come in all sorts of interesting shapes. Um, we bought one for a couple of grand. Uh, ours is a red egg shape. And we thought we'd make it into uh, an interactive ride. So the aim of Black and Bronco is it's a machine that you ride and it tries to throw you off. And at the end, it does throw you off. That's the fun. But we thought we'd change the game a bit, and we also made the Bucking Bronco respond to your breathing. So, although the ride got harder, if you breathed a lot, it got even harder. It was a very simple mapping. If you breathed in, it moved to the left, and if you breathed out, it moved to the right. But that was enough. That was enough, because the ride is pushing back at you, making you breathe more, and your breathing is pushing back at the ride, making it move more. And so you end up in some bizarre, human machine interactive loop situation as you're desperately struggling to stay on. So a um, little bit of video of the, uh, the Bucking Rocco, although it only really shows what I just said, but we might as well see it. sense that sooner or later they're going to have to breathe again and when they do things are going to get a lot worse for them than they are right now and that moment of trying to fight your own body at the same time as trying to fight the machine is the pinnacle moment of the ride sitting there and figuring out the situation you're now in 
So that was the wrong combative. Brendan took it just one stage further, he couldn't resist. He built a second breath control ride, and this one was a swing. Similar idea, the more you breathed, the more it would swing. And if you could breathe in synchronisation with the swing, it would push it further and further. So this was a ride about keeping your nerve, keeping breathing steadily in order to push it further and, uh, and kind of not chickening out. He also changed the interaction device. Whereas before he was using a chest strap to approximate the breathing, he now put the breathing sensors in a rubberized gas mask. So people were wearing this rather nasty rubber device on their face, sitting on a swing uh, in an attempt to have a ride. This wasn't quite enough for Brendan. He wanted to think about the design of the entire ride experience, not just what happened to you on the swing. Because when you go on a roller coaster, it starts the minute you get in the queue with the build-up, and it finishes when you end up in the shop, sometimes afterwards. So Brendan's inspiration for the ride was a, was a painting. Uh, it was this painting, by uh, Fragonard, so he told me. This painting is um, it's a bit naughty, to be honest. It shows an Edwardian lady enjoying the physical sensation of swinging. In the background is her husband, who is controlling her by doing the swinging. And in the foreground is her lover, who is looking up her skirts every time she swings past. And that's Brendan's ride design, more or less. So he took this as his inspiration, and he said that breathless would work. You would start off in a queue, and at some point you would be kitted up with the gas mask, which is a process that takes several minutes. And then you would sit in a chair with a spotlight on you, watching other people on the ride, and you'd be the voyeur. You'd be the one in the bushes. Then you got to have a go on the ride, and at first your breathing would control the swinging. But after a while, it wouldn't. It turned out that it was somebody else's breathing who was now controlling the swinging. And that was the controller, a third person. And then finally, after you'd been the rider, you got to be the controller. So you got to sit in another chair with a spotlight on you and at some point control someone else's swinging. So Brendan set up a pretty complicated structure in which you got to experience this phenomena from various, various different perspectives. And uh, here's just a couple of stills from Breathless, uh, give you some vague sense of what it looked like. So time is pressing, and while I could go on talking about individual examples for several hours, I think I promised you a cookbook of nasty tactics or strategies or something like that, didn't I? So, in the end, what lessons can we generalise from examples such as those and others about the use of discomfort in interaction design. Well, I'm going to suggest to you four broad strategies that look at different facets of discomfort. The first one is visceral, physical discomfort. Let's think about the physical aspects. Nearly all of these experiences have got some element of physicality to them. It appears to be important. And here I've got several tactics that I think uh, created. <laughs> Undoubtedly, one of them is strenuous physical activity. Being on a bucking bronco or a serious roller coaster is a strenuous thing. There's a complex relationship between physical activity and emotion and your receptivity to the experiences. And within HCI, there's a whole crowd of people we are now looking at exertion games, led by Floyd Muller in particular at RMIT in Australia, who are looking at this intense relationship between gaming, interactivity and physical stress and exertion. So designing in physical activity is definitely one tactic for introducing an element of discomfort, make people tired and exhausted. Physicality also applies to the interaction devices themselves. So the keyboards and the mice that we use 
these days are pretty anodyne bits of plastic and metal. And to my fingers, they don't feel very much at all. A gas mask is far from that. It's smelly, sweaty, hot, rubbery, clings to your skin. The example here is from a piece of work that appeared at Kai a few years ago called The Meat Book, in which you interacted with raw meat in order to control digital media. In itself, a bizarre and frankly quite uncomfortable experience. Okay, why not go the whole hog? Why not hurt people? Now that is a shocking idea, but there are interfaces that also do it by literally shocking people. Not in a serious way, but this is a, uh, a small electric shock reaction test game that I bought off the internet and I occasionally use with my students, particularly when they are not handing their work in on time. And it's a simple enough game. Everybody takes the con a controller, four of you. You wait for the light to come on. When the light goes off, the last person to let go of the controller gets an electric shock. Anyone who lets go of it before the light goes off also gets an electric shock. It doesn't kill you, it doesn't seem to do you any permanent damage, but it does hurt, and it makes you a pretty uncomfortable, but on the whole, quite amusing game to play. There are other artworks in the literature that have done things like make users hold their hands against a heating up metal plate while they watch a story, to the point where they feel they have to remove their hands, and they can no longer follow the story. So there are examples out there doing this. Moving away from physicality, let's talk about control. Control is central to HCI. The craft of the, the interface designer is to get somebody to control the machine. And as I said in the introduction, we have a set of well-defined principles for how control should work. Ben Schneiderman says, Quite rightly, the locus of control shall remain with the user. It's one of his golden rules. The user should be in control. So if you distort that relationship, you're going to make people feel uncomfortable. You're going to be breaking the way things usually work. So surrendering, giving up control to the machine is definitely part of the tactic we're seeing the artists use. That's what Brendan's doing. That's what any ride designer is doing. A modern ride is, after all, a computer with an interface stuck on it. The interface is a track and a cart, but it's all computerised. And uh, essentially what you're doing is giving yourself up for three minutes to the complete and utter control of a computing system. Surrendering control to other people is also interesting. So last theory, take control of you in our reach from Amen. And they increasingly do it through the experience. And each time you say, I'm willing to go on a bit further, they get more and more demanding in how you have to comply with their instructions. In Breathless, Brendan gives over control to another user altogether. And then the final tactic is this reminder, I guess, of something I've already said. And that's this notion of battling your own body actually battling yourself for control. And I think this is particularly powerful because a number of the technologies we're bringing to HCI now, physiological monitoring, and now great computer interfaces, which are commercially available, these are, at some level, inherently uncontrollable. You cannot control how you breathe. Your autonomic system will take over after a while. You cannot control what you think. Uh, you can control it for short periods of time. Speaking to you now, I'm controlling my breath in a, a very clear way, but you can't keep it up forever. And so even your own body becomes the battleground with this kind of interaction. And that's an uncomfortable experience. <coughs> Strategy three. So, computers aren't only about controlling stuff anymore. For the last few decades, they've also been about social relationships. Computers are now at the heart of how we interact with other people, through email and social media and all of that good stuff. So if you mess around with that, then you could distort people's social relationships and again, make them feel uncomfortable. So here are some tactics. Intimacy with strangers. I'm not so sure about how a Korean audience feels about intimacy with strangers, but in Britain, 
it's not really the done thing, to be honest. Intimacy with your family is, on the whole, not really the done thing in Britain, but intimacy with strangers is definitely out of the question. So if you put people in a one-to-one -one with an actor in a room, they're pretty uncomfortable. Or if, like Floyd Muller and his team here, with their musical embrace, you put a device between two strangers' bodies and encourage them to hug each other in order to squeeze it and interact with music, then you set up a situation where people do feel profoundly uncomfortable. Hugging and squeezing a stranger is, a, for most people, a really bad experience. A weird form of intimacy is to have no, inter no intimacy whatsoever, to be isolated from people. And this is one of Blast Theory's favourite tactics. Whenever they do one of the locating works, you always end up in the city, on your own, lost, with nobody else around that you know. And that's a phenomenally powerful thing, to take away all the social comforts of someone who might be able to tell you what to do and leave you on your own with just the technology. Very powerful. And last of all, computers are good at surveillance. Remote video cameras, collecting people's data, all of this we know from the debates we're having about what happens to our data is part and parcel of what they do. And surveillance and voyeurism are tactics that we see running throughout all of the works that I presented. In our reclaimment, there's that sense of being watched all the time doing these weird gestures. There's not only discomfort in being watched, but potentially discomfort in watching other people. One of Brendan's subsequent experiences was to send parents into a horror maze filmed around the Saw theme, while children, not young children, teenage children, watched on on a screen. And this was a pretty uncomfortable experience. Seeing your mother apparently scared in a horror maze is something that sets up a, a particular discomfort. So to watch other people. And then sometimes it's uncomfortable when somebody watches you watching things. If you're watching things that you're not really meant to watch, and somebody else is watching you, you don't want to give away how you're feeling about it, do you? And the last strategy. We shouldn't forget also the meaning that's inherent to play. It's not just about physical stuff, it's not just about control and social connections. There is meaning in these works. So the themes themselves, of course, are uncomfortable in some cases. Perhaps not Brendan's work, but Blast Theory certainly. And the devices, the choice of a gas mask also has important cultural meanings. My parents, uh, the children during the war, my mother tells me about carrying a gas mask to school, having to put it on and hide under the table. If I present her with a gas mask and ask her to put it on, it's going to have some pretty strong memories uh, for her and conjure those up instantly. Okay, enough. Enough with the tactics. I feel like a very bad person. I feel like there's a, a room full of people, hopefully, who aren't paying any attention, but maybe a few of them are writing this down, and maybe a few of the few are going to go and do something about it. And uh, we might all live to regret it. So let's end with a few words about being ethical before you say, Steve Benford told me to cause pain to you. It's not my fault. On the whole, the ultimate point of these experiences is not to make people uncomfortable. It is, remember, to entertain them, to enlighten them, to socially mold them. And if they don't do that, you're definitely in trouble. On the whole, most of these experiences don't leave people feeling uncomfortable at the end. That's not always true. Some artworks do. You leave the gallery still feeling uncomfortable, you think about it for a long time afterwards. But roller coasters don't work like that. It's a bad roller coaster where people come off feeling bad. Even the Ride Virgin was happy to be alive at the end of that piece of video, and it almost looked as if you'd do it again, although I wonder whether he would really. So you need to think of discomfort as a journey, and you need to design it as such. And to understand the journey, let's go back to a little bit of theatre, a little bit of performance theory. Gustav Freitag, who proposed the pyramid model of performance. You may be sort of familiar with it. 
basically says, drama, a performance, consists of several stages. There's exposition, setting the scene, introducing the characters, explaining what's going to happen. Rising action, a gradual, ramped up, slow, increase in dramatic tension and suspense. A climactic moment where everything unfolds. Falling action, as things begin to get resolved and play out. And a denouement, when things may or may not become clear, and you get to understand and reflect. So I think if you're designing the kinds of experiences I'm talking about, you need a picture like that in mind. Maybe it will have more peaks and troughs in it than just one, but those <coughs> principles apply. Notice the way I've drawn it. The falling action and the climax implicitly don't pertain perhaps quite as much time as the rising action. That I would suggest is a good strategy. You're better off to give people anticipation and a not so bad, shorter, uncomfortable experience than to give them a very gentle ramp up and then make them feel terrible all of a sudden. And by way of proof, here is the Oblivion roller coaster, the world's first vertical drop roller coaster, and look at it. It is exactly a manifestation of Gustav Freitag's five act structure of drama, isn't it? You can perfectly map it onto the exposition, the rising action, the climax, literally the falling action, and finally the doing the more. So I guess what I'm saying to you is design discomfort into a, into a journey. Resolve it, and at the end of the day, remember entertainment, enlightenment, and sociality. Even then, you may be entering a bit of a minefield. It's not as simple as that. There are lots of specific ethical dilemmas to deal with. And if you're a researcher working in this space, working with creative people and artists, you're going to have to confront those when dealing with your ethics committees and institutional review boards. So when we started this work with artists 20 years ago, we didn't have an ethics committee in computer science, we probably did in a medical school somewhere, but not in CS. What we do now, and this work of this kind has to be run past them and justified, quite rightly too. But it's difficult. It's difficult for several reasons. Um, ethics committees and review boards, the ones in computer science and HCI, I think, certainly the ones I've, I know and have dealt with, their ethical process and model is grounded in an experimental one. It's grounded in experimental psychology, which is somehow grounded in medicine, and that has a set of concerns about doing an awful lot of work with participants on the way into an experience, quite rightly to getting consent nailed down, written down, uh, absolutely agreed, legally watertight. Some of the things that artists do prove quite difficult to accommodate within that model. So firstly, artists are deliberately transgressive. Deliberately so. Not all of them, but a good many of them pick on issues that society finds difficult. It's not uncommon in the UK, I'm sure it is in Korea too, for arts, artworks to be banned, or if they're not banned, to cause outrage in the newspapers. 20 years later, they're often seen as great pieces of art, but at the time, they were exactly prodding an ethical or moral issue that society was struggling to deal with. So when you turn up to an ethics committee one of these bits of work, not always, but sometimes, you know that you're pushing the button. You know from the outset that you're deliberately provoking discussion around an issue. That can be quite hard. And artists tend to deal and cross people's personal boundaries, too. They push people to the limits. Now, they're good at doing this because they're good at judging those limits and they have, on the whole, a relationship of trust that these good artists do. And they can build up consent during a performance and work out the line and work out when to back off. But as a researcher, those things are not so clear. Consent and withdrawal are quite difficult to deal with. Uh, most of the artists we work with seriously don't like the idea of us as researchers giving people forms before a performance and asking them to fill them in and sign up their consent. That breaks the exposition of the artwork, the framing of it, in the first place. So that's a real challenge. 
One group of artists we worked with made an alternate reality game based around a scientific conspiracy. And it became very clear that even if we asked the participants to sign an ethics form, they thought it was part of the game anyway. So it wasn't clear whether they were giving their consent or not. I do have a, an alternative suggestion though for how to deal with all the problems. I think with this kind of work, you need to pay more attention to ethics on the way out. So yes, you must do ethical process on the way in. Yes, you must think about consent and safety. I'm not saying don't do anything. But unlike the sort of medical model where you sign everyone up and then on the whole you don't go back to talk to them afterwards, with this kind of work, you should give the audiences a forum to shout at you. So there should be an ethical process, but often it's after the artwork where people try and make sense of it. If people are offended, let them shout, have a discussion. That's the point. So I would argue for ethical processes, but maybe rethinking about how they're done. Well, I look at the clock, and I notice it's running out. So um, I hope it has made you too uncomfortable watching the artworks. I hope you take something away from it, but perhaps not the bit about causing pain to people, at least not to me anyway, but I'm going for that. If you are interested in knowing more, then uh, please do buy the book, uh, but equally there's a couple of papers, one on discomfort and a more recent one on the ethics of HCI Stones to the Cultural that you might like to take a look at. And thank you very much indeed for your invitation and your attention. Uh, or whatever, 
uh, very subordinate things you need to keep games without really thinking about it, without feeling uncomfortable about it, um, maybe without feeling suspense if it's a, a shoot em up game. I guess there is suspense, you might be killed, but in the moment. So, you know, I think things can be fun and horrific in a game because perhaps the designers haven't done enough with this kind of thing. I think more interesting is to perhaps in game design take the fun out of those actions but bring in the thrill and the suspense so to make people in some sense live the more understandable and reflective way. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in your work, um, it, it, you know, it sounded by design you are uh, designing to be transgressive and boundary pushing. And in doing that, have you come up against any boundaries that you don't want to go beyond? And so I guess when, when I was listening to your talk, I was thinking, are there, um, are there good sorts of discomfort and bad sorts of discomfort and what sorts of insights have you gained? Um, so in, in our works, we are not, traditionally, we didn't see ourselves as the designers. We made quite a strong separation between the artists uh, and our role as the technologists and people who studied and reflected on that. And that's not to absolve ourselves of any responsibility. We're still responsible for deciding who we want to work with. And there have been artists and people who come from us with proposals and things that for various reasons we didn't feel comfortable to do, we felt unable to do. Um, uh, more lately, I guess it's got a, a bit more confused because there are now several artist researcher, possibly researcher artist characters in the group. So I guess those boundaries between creation, um, uh, yeah, creation research have become much more kind of blurred. Um, whether yeah. Whether I can kind of answer the question now in principle, like, are there any kinds of discomfort that I wouldn't do? I don't know. I mean, I have my own moral compass. There are some topics I don't want to engage with, some topics I think are not appropriate, some things that I believe are uh, too obscene to put in front of people, some things that I know that are legally obscene or inappropriate that I'm not engaged with. So I wouldn't do things that are illegal, um, uh, unless as a Personal protest, I'm prepared to go down there, which I'm not. I don't know if that answers the question, but yes, there are, there are limits, Just and it is an ethical and moral judgment about the kind of work you a, a quick follow up, I guess, are there some experiences of discomfort that don't work, like, that, that don't serve the purpose that you're aiming to accomplish in terms of sociality or um, enlightenment or entertainment? I think we've certainly made our We've made interactive pieces that some of which don't work, and some work less well than others, and some of that because they're not so well thought through, and some of that may be about the ways in which they do it. Um, and we have had examples of experiences where people have been really upset by things and left and wanted their money back um, and wanted to shout at the artists afterwards, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, but whether, yeah, then there's a reflection on the team on whether that is a bad artwork or whether that's uh, to someone who didn't get it. I'm not answering your question in any specific way, I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any 